Okay, so when I was in high school, me and my friends got to a class early. The teacher hadn't showed up. The bell hadn't rung yet. And so we had all gotten into our class early, and there was this big blank whiteboard. And all the markers were out, and we were like, oh, it's go time. So we all grabbed markers, and we're scribbling and drawing stupid pictures and writing stupid things and writing our names and messages and all sorts of stuff. And, and then it gets closer to the time where the teacher's going to be coming in. And so people start erasing stuff. And see, I had, I had written something that was not appropriate. God bless you, my son. Um, so I had written something not appropriate. Okay, I can't even tell you what it was. It was so inappropriate. So I write it, and my friend is like, no way, Kate, you did that. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, I did. I'm so cool. And then everyone's erasing their stuff, and they go, Kate, leave it up there. Leave it. Just leave it. Like, your name's not on it. Just leave it there. We'll see what Mr. Kelly says. Like, um, um, I don't think so. Like, I'm not super proud of this. I did it because everybody else is doing it. Um, uh, come on, leave it. Just leave it. It'll be funny. Oh, okay. All right. So we erase everything except for the one thing that I wrote that's totally not appropriate. We all scatter. We all go to our seats. We sit down. The teacher walks in. The bell rings. And we're like, all right. Okay, cool. And then he gets to his podium. And he goes, who wrote this? Who wrote this on my board? And everyone's sitting there silently, stunned, kind of looking around. Um, who's going to sell out Kate? Is Kate going to sell herself out? And no one does. Everyone's got my back. It's totally fine. And then he goes, OK, well, we're not going to start class. We're just going to sit here and wait until someone tells me who did it or someone confesses. Oh, no. And then it gets really awkward, like, oh, how long is everyone going to have my back? Well. If there's one thing you should know about me is I can be awfully dramatic sometimes. I really try not to be because of moments like this. I have this dramatic outburst monologue apology. In the middle of class, my teacher goes, apology not accepted. Go to the principal's office. I become suspended for the day. I go home. My dad has some like horrible choice words for me. And basically, I allowed the people in my class to pressure me into trying to look cool, writing something not OK, and then leaving it there and letting my teacher see it and being completely disrespectful and out of line. And it earned me, because I'm the one who made those choices, no matter what everyone else told me, it earned me some big trouble. OK? But I also have another story from high school where I had a really awesome group of friends that, golly, I wish were in that same classroom that day. And we used to come early for zero period. Do any of you guys go to school early for like whatever your extracurricular things are? So we used to come to school for zero period. And one of my friends was like, wouldn't it be cool if like we wrote some encouraging notes or verses for people and put it in their lockers? And I was like, mm, I don't know, or like going around a group. Yeah, I guess that sounds nice. She's like, no, no, what if we all got together? Like, let's get together. We can, like, look up verses. We can handwrite, like, hundreds of these little notes. We can put them in people's lockers and, like, surprise them one day. So it took a little bit of, like, come on, guys. Let's do it. It'll be fun. So one day after school or a couple days after school, we get together. We cut up the papers. We look up verses. We handwrite hundreds of these notes. We fold them all. And then one day, we come to school early for zero period, and we go through every locker on our campus and slip a cute little note inside of the little slots in their lockers. And that day, we got to bless people by an unexpected kindness. They got to have an encouragement from the Holy Spirit through that verse. We got to be the hands and feet of awesomeness because we made people's days better. All because I had a, a friend in a friend group that encouraged each other and was like, come on, guys, let's do something awesome. Let's be cool people and, like, love people. And so we did. And here is what I want to talk about today. We're in a series called No Matter What in the Book of Philippians. So if you guys want to start flipping to Philippians, that's where we're going to be at. But the series is called No Matter What. And last week... Travis talked about how no matter what, we can have joy. And this week, I want to talk about how no matter what, we can have influence. Whether it's my friends in class 
that influenced me or affected me and changed my behavior or my thoughts or the things that I wrote down. They had influence over me. Or just like my friends that helped write encouraging notes, they had influence over me. It can be used either as this negative word of peer pressure that we know, that I'm sure we've all experienced in some way, or we can have positive peer pressure. We can push people to go in the right direction towards positivity and helpfulness and kindness. You see, statistically, the five people that we are closest to are the ones who affect us the most, okay? The rule of five is that the five people I spend the most time with, the five people that are around me the most often, those are the five people that affect who I am the most. Like you'll notice maybe sometimes your friends start saying a certain word all the time. Like, like I hang out with Travis and I try to not let him affect me too much because he says tweak all the time. You know, like just tweak that and then you just tweak that and then Jesus tweaks you and you know, all these, he, all the tweaking, okay? But you know how like your friends start to say something and then you start saying the same thing? You're like, whoa. Riley in the back, she always says, do it, you won't, and now I freaking say it too, okay? But catch this. But catch this, okay? If there's five people around you influencing you, whose five are you in? Like, if Laura is my friend and I'm in her top five, how am I influencing Laura? If I'm in Lily's top five, and I know I am because she's my daughter and I'm like the best, um, how am I influencing her? We're influencing people no matter what. In a room this size during worship, when we're talking, how are we influencing the people around us if we're not worshiping? Or if we are during worship, worshiping and going all out and focusing on who it is that we're worshiping, how are we affecting the people around us? We're always influencing, whether we mean to or not. So today, we're talking about how do I have influence? How do I use that power on purpose for good? Because Paul here has some things to say, and he's got some hot tips. So we're in Philippians chapter 1. There are 13 books in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul has written 13 of them. Wait, did I do that right? 26 books in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul has written 13 of them. Four of them he's written while in prison. This is one of them, okay? Written from a prison cell, attached to a big burly bodyguard person. Like, that's how they did it. It wasn't free roam style. You were literally attached to your guard, okay? And you can imagine the guard probably didn't like Paul, all right? So Paul's chained on one side to this homie, and on the other side, he's writing this letter to the church in Philippi. We're going to start in verse 12. We'll read it all, and then we'll come back through it. Philippians 1, verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, not like his family, but his family in Christ, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I'm in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice because I know this will lead to my salvation through the prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or or by death. So imagine him sitting in this cell, chained to a guard, writing this letter of encouragement 
to everyone who's not in prison. Someone who's in a crap place, encouraging those that aren't in that same crap place with this kind of joy. He says, rejoice twice. No matter what, he's using his influence. He's not using it as an excuse of where he's at. So in these first few verses, he talks about how because he's in there, the whole imperial guard knows of Jesus and that other brothers have gained confidence because of how he is handling this situation. You see, what I learn is that my influence comes from maximizing every opportunity. My influence comes from maximizing every opportunity. Every moment that you have breath, every moment that you are next to another human, you have an opportunity to influence. You have an opportunity to steer people in one direction or another. That's powerful, guys. I think some of us think we don't matter. Some of us think, like, I don't have enough power to do anything. I don't have a ton of friends. I don't have this platform. I don't stand on a stage. Guys, that's not an excuse. He was by himself in a prison cell. He changed the eternities of of thousands of people forever because he didn't use that as an excuse. Because he charged it and was like, I'm getting after it. But here's the thing that's super confusing and frustrating is because on this earth, the way that we use um, a reward system, like I have kids that are in elementary school and you know, like when you're doing good, you move your clip up. And when you're doing bad, you move your clip down. Or when you grow up and you're like, okay, I'm doing chores, so I earn an allowance. That means I'm doing good things, so I get a reward. Or if I get a bad report card and it comes home in the mail and then my parents find out and then they're like pissed at me and they take away my phone and that's a consequence because I did something bad. So much of what we do on this earth is going, well, if I do good things, then I get good things. And so it's kind of hard to understand that Paul was doing great things. He was telling people about Jesus. Then why the heck is he in a prison cell? That doesn't seem like a reward. That seems like a punishment. I think we have to understand that if we're truly following Christ, that in order to maximize our opportunities, we kind of have to be aware that some people aren't going to like our influence. Even if it's a good influence in pointing them towards Christ, some people don't like that. It's offensive. You're telling me that you're, like, just going to judge me? That I'm not doing things right? You're telling me that I can't just do whatever the heck I want? There's a lot of parts of Christianity that aren't appealing. There's a lot of parts that if you mention you go to church, people are like, ew. We had a lot of problems, honestly, last year on our tournament series team because pe- we were a Chick-fil-A team. We were like, ew, Chick-fil-A, it's a Christian organization. That's a bummer. But sometimes when you're doing things right, it means people won't like you as much. That's, that's hard. But I want you to know that I'm not asking you to do something easy. But this is how Paul tells us we can have influence. All right, let's jump into the second part here. We are going to be in verse 15. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. He's talking about that joy again, like what Travis talked about last week, is that so much of this world and this culture is pursuing happiness. If I could just be popular, if I could just be successful, if I could just have this thing or that, we try to accrue things that are only going to last on this planet, 
and not forever. Because God made an emptiness in us that can only be filled by him. But we try so hard pursuing happiness to fill that void. So when Travis last week talked about how we can have joy no matter what, that's talking about having a peace and a happiness that comes beyond our circumstances. It's not affected by it. That's how Paul is able to rejoice while in a jail cell, knowing that Christ is being proclaimed out there. What Paul is telling us is that his influence is different than the fakers. Because his influence comes from motivating others through love. His influence and my influence comes from motivating others through love. Through love. But you know what? I, I love cereal so much. I could eat it for every meal, forever and always. I love cereal. I love my cats. I'm a cat person. I joke all the time with my husband that one day when he's not around anymore, I might have 18 cats and I'll be okay with it. But I also love my husband and I love my kids. Do I love them all in the same way? Probably not. Our English culture has like a really broad description of the word love. But I think a lot of us think of how I feel when we say that. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to jump over into 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians. It's to your left. 1 Corinthians 13. And I have a exercise for us to do. If you think you can handle it. Can you guys handle it if I give us an exercise to do? Can you be not lame and disappointing? I believe in you. All right, 1 Corinthians 13. Hurry, 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 get there. This is another book that Paul wrote. And what we're going to do, okay? I need you to work with me here. I know you can do it. Whenever we, we're going to read through four verses. Whenever we say something that is an emotion or a feeling, I want you to snap. Can you guys snap? All right, awesome. Well done. Okay, and end scene. No more snapping. Okay, so when you say, or when I read a feeling or an emotion, you snap one time. One snap for a feeling. If I say an action, you clap one time, okay? It's not an applause. It's a single clap, okay? Can you do that? Clap. Okay, what do we do when there's a feeling? What do we do when there's an action? Okay, I'm going to read this. You don't even have to follow along, but I'm going to read it out loud. You're going to listen, and when you hear a feeling, you're going to snap. And when I say an action, you're going to clap. Got it? Can you do this? Okay, good, I believe in you. All right, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, not self-seeking, is not irritable, does not keep a record of wrongs, <laughs> love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. I think truth is a noun in that. Is that? Okay. Um, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes, you guys clap weird places, <laughs> and endures all things. Okay. So here's what I'm getting at. Well then, okay, give yourselves a hand. Get it out of your system. Yay, you, you did it. Three, two, one. Good job. You guys could be on the prices right. Okay, so here's what this is telling us. We clapped a ton in that. And anytime you snapped, well, you were wrong. Because every time it said love, it described it as an action. So here's what I'm learning from that. And what blew my mind years ago is that I don't have to like someone to love them. What, you guys? I don't have to like people in order to treat them with kindness or to have patience or to not be irritable or to not remember every dang thing they've done wrong. I don't have to like them in order to have an action that loves them. 
Do you think Paul liked being chained to some giant bodyguard man next to him? Probably not. Do you think the bodyguard liked Paul? Probably not. But our scripture in Philippians tells us that he's influenced the imperial guard. Dude chained next to him is being influenced by an inmate because the inmate knows how to love with an action. Imagine that. Imagine if the way that we treated people at our school, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done to us, no matter what they've done to our friends, no matter, no matter how we judge them and their family life and how they dress, what if the way that we acted was motivated out of love? And then they wanted to hear what we had to say. See, we have a thing coming up um, in a couple months called Tournament Series. Have you heard of it? Yeah, me too. I've heard of it. So we a whole month long in October in junior high, we do a thing called tournament series. And it's incredible because we all show up and we do the craziest tournament sale games. We scream our hearts out. We dress up like our teams. We fight and we cheer and it's the best. And why are we doing it? To win a trip to Six Flags, because that's what we're being motivated by. If we're motivated by something, then it causes us to do something. If we're motivated by love, then we're going to go and love others. And it's going to impact them in a far greater way than if I'm just doing it selfishly or arrogantly or for my own gain. People see through that crap like that. So if we're loving others, how much more influence can we have in every opportunity that we are around people? All right, next part. Okay, verse 18. We're going to finish this. All right, halfway through 18, it says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from Spirit of Christ Jesus. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything. But that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul knows why he's doing what he's doing. He knows where his courage comes from. He knows why it's worth being in prison. See, he knows the greatest secret of all. He knows that no matter what, he can gain influence by maintaining his focus on eternity. By maintaining his focus on eternity. A lot of us made choices to follow Christ at camp. Or we have years ago or in other ministries. But that's, a walk with Christ isn't just one decision. It's a decision every single day. It's following after Christ Every moment, it's remembering that we have to fight against ourselves and we have to keep our eyes on Christ. We have to maintain our focus on eternity. How many of you guys have ever heard of a car? Okay, uh, big hint. Y'all should raise your hand there. Okay, well, that was fun. Okay, so here's what I want you to just understand. For those of you who don't know how cars work or how they get places, okay, is that you need a car, one. Two, you need a driver, okay? Driver gets in the seat. Not any seat in the car. It has to be the driver's seat. And when you're in the driver's seat, in order to make your car go, it has to be turned on. And then in order for it to go once it's on, you have to press the gas pedal. But here's the thing. We're not talking about Teslas. If you're going to raise your hand and talk to me about the auto driving crap, I'm not even here for it. Okay? So, you start driving, but catch this. If you don't have a place to be driving, then what's the point of being in your car? Nothing. Okay? So, when we get in the car every day, we typically have a destination, correct? We have like, I have to get to school, or I have to get to practice, or I have to get to the movies, or I have to get to a fun hangout with my friends, or I have to get to church. We have a destination, we have a place to go, and the place that we're going determines every turn that we take on the road. It determines the responsibility we have to stay in our lane, to look for the stoplight up ahead, to drive safely. 
If we know where our destination is, if our destination is eternity, that affects how we drive on our roadmap of life. Eternity should change what we do every single day. Just like it changed for Paul. But catch this. Here's something that I found so encouraging is in verse 20. It says, my eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything. Guys, he gets it. He is scared. He's anxious about how people will not like him. It's like he understands what it's like to be in junior high and feel like you have to dress the right way or be in the right group or say the right things, or act the right way so that your friends will include, include you. But here's something even scarier. What if your friend found out you were a Christian and went, I never knew you were a Christian. What if everything that we do at church we show up on Tuesdays, we show up on the weekend, and our friends never even realize that Jesus is a part of our life. What was the point? Is Jesus changing us from the inside out every single day, every single moment? Or is my life only focused on myself? So that is my challenge for you guys is that we're all going to have influence. We're all going to do it whether you mean to or not. The moment you step out of this room, while you sit in these chairs, we are influencing. We are affecting others. But am I focusing on a life fulfilled by Christ? Or am I just focusing on a life filled with me? Do I make people different? Because they're like, yeah, you're a cool person, but like, that's it. Or am I helping change eternities? Am I living in response to a relationship with Christ? We all have the power to influence. We all have the power to change everything around us. Paul did it 2,000 years ago, and we're still reading his notes. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much for today, and thank you, God, for who you are. God, thank you that you are timeless. That no matter where we are on the timeline of this entire universe, God, you are relevant. God, you are our Savior, and you are who makes all of this purposeful. God, I ask that you will help us to walk away differently and challenged because of what your word has spoken to us today. In your name we pray. Amen.